Robin Smith was brilliantly caught at short leg and must surely now be rested to try to work out the spinners. Hick had his usual nervy time against a fired up Merv Hughes. He'll have to frustrate the big Australian for much of tomorrow if England are to save this game. Golf. Lee Jansen, the little-known American from Florida, won the U.S. Open tonight. His 272 total equals the Open scoring record. He beat former champion Payne Stewart by two shots. The best shot of the day came from Sandy Lyle. He was struggling at four over par at the 12th hole. was the 12th hole-in-one of his career. And that's the news tonight from all of us here on the weekend team. Good night. Good evening. After quite a fine day for most of us, and we maintain this theme for a fair few days to come. The reason why? We have high pressure in charge for most of the coming week. Slight hiccup, though, in the very far north with these fronts skimming by, so slightly more unsettled feel. Moving on to tonight, very much a two-way split with that cloud, thick to the north, thin to the south. In terms of weather, meaning some misty patches floating around here, watch out for those if you're driving, and possibly bits and pieces of showery rain or drizzle in the north. So, going into tomorrow, brand new week, starting off with Scotland, again, cloudy skies in the north, and again, some showers, but really not amounting to anything very much at all. Further south, here, it's very much a case of that cloud out to the west, and the very best of the sunshine tomorrow reserved for central as well as eastern parts. Then, much like today, as the afternoon ticks by, well, that cloud really does start piling up, and we could possibly see the odd shower showing up, especially so in Northern Ireland, or the west of Wales and England. With temperatures a touch down on today's values, anything between 17 to 20, that's 63 to 68, and a light wind in the offing. Good night. <laughs> Country Focus. On the west at work, we're at Heathrow, where we join the region's first-class commuters and ask, do they prefer to travel by train or by plane? And free-range eggs. Why West Country producers are being paid chicken feed, while supermarkets get fat profits. And who are Cornwall's elite army of cleaners, and why are they banned from using feather dusters? The West at Work has the answer, Monday at 10.40. In a moment, the South Bank Show pays tribute to one of Britain's most popular sculptors, Dame Elizabeth Frink. On Wednesday, the high flyers are getting too clever by half. You haven't by any chance seen any rosins around? Would you like me to get them for you, sir? Another country bumpkin comes our way. As a matter of fact, you could have a thing about that. These two gentlemen are customs officers. What's this all about? They think it may have been smugglers. What is it they're smuggling? Some questions are best left unasked. Here, the Darling Buds of May movie, Wednesday at 8. England expects every man to pay his duty. What feels like this and looks like this but smells like this? New unscented Dove. It won't dry your skin like soap can. Who offers you a coupe that reflects your driving passion? that meets with admiration whenever it's met. Its presence conjures the irresistible desire to take the wheel and drive. And who offers all this for under 11,000 pounds? I own guy. That's who. One, two, three, four, oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twenty. Oh, that's a lot of oranges. New Galaxy Dove ice cream. Galaxy Chocolate makes ice cream supreme. Throughout June, BT are running another special offer. This time on local cheap rate calls over four minutes. 
For example, a 20-minute call will cost just 15p. Nobody can fail to find a bargain in our sale. You can all snap up a snip, of course you can. If you're chasing carpets, buying beds or new settees, you can plan a life of ease, of course you can. The choice is so diverse, something sure to suit your purse. At savings, which are bigger than you thought. Court sale is unsurpassed, these bargains can occur. Court's biggest ever summer sale is on now, and we're open this weekend. Hello, Brian. How's business? Oh, fine. Great. How about you? Yes. We're growing really quickly. Of course, when you get to our size, growth tends to be more planned. Actually, John, I hear you're thinking of expanding your dairy herd. Yes, just a formality with the bank manager, really. So, it's all into Europe next, then, eh? If you want your business to run like a dream, and not a nightmare, Talk to the tech. Still no answer, sir. Right, Buff. We're going in. Uh, Wendy. Snake bites. Right, Buff. You listen to his clothing. I'll get the local doctor. Our medico, Akiperto. Habai, adior. Last. What is it, sir? Apparently, he is the local doctor. That's enough loosening now, Buff. We're looking for his Barclay card, sir. His Barclay card? This man's in no state to go shopping. Oh. No, I'm going to phone him up for medical advice, sir. You're going to phone Barclay Card for medical advice? Barclay Card International Rescue, sir. They can send doctors and... We're wasting time here, Boff. This man has a serious case of snake bite, and there's only one thing that's going to save him. I'm going to have to locate the wound and suck out the poison. Yes, actually, I think I should better phone Barclay Card, Boff. I'm not sure I've got there. You know, my lips were a little... But, uh, well, I thought I had a solution, but then... <laughs> For decades, artists have been drawn to St. Ives by the quality of the light and the beauty of the landscape. The small harbour town has profited from the presence of the artists, but in the past they struggled to survive. Lots of the artists are as poor as church mice. Now, a new multi-million pound Tate Gallery in St. Ives honours its art and artists with an official opening by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Visit the Tate in the West, Wednesday, 10.40 on West Country. Now, Melvin Bragg presents the South Bank Show. Now, Mick Sharkey and Derek Bailey had begun to film the work of Elizabeth Frink earlier this year. Sadly, in April she died, and so this is both a testament and an obituary. She was one of the best known and best loved of British post-war artists. Like many of my generation, I was moved and impressed by her work, which was powerful, accessible, rooted in the past, and yet spoke directly to the present. She died at no great age and is much missed. Elizabeth Frink. Easter Day is always our most special day in the year as Christians. Today for us, there is another very special feature. As we've approached the cathedral, the niche over the Great West Door has stood empty since the cathedral was completed in 1978. This morning, after the service, we shall see that the empty space is now filled figure of Christ will be unveiled and dedicated. Sunday, 18th of April, 
Elizabeth Frink died. She was 62. More works by Elizabeth Frink are seen by the public in open-air sites in this country than any other sculptor. Frinker gave the rather dead currency of figurative sculpture a fresh credibility. She kept faith with her vision and became, surprisingly enough in modern times, a genuinely popular artist, much loved by a big public on a broad front. I think this piece of sculpture stands in the ugliest setting that is possible in London. I mean, you really couldn't get much more hideous. And there you have the most humane, beautifully scaled piece of sculpture. Frink's famous image of a horse and rider reflects an idealized balance between man and the animal world in perfect health, uh, coming together in ease, trust, balance, and composure. People say that sculpture should work on three different levels, and these are the three levels that you check your work against every day that you walk into your studio and it's to do with distance and scale. And when you look at a piece of sculpture from maybe 10, 15 foot, you see the whole thing, you see the composition. You then move up closer till you're um, a foot away and the tension of the surface has to be exciting. That again has to hold your interest. You know, any which way you judge Frink sculpture, it's working on. And the third element is the narrative side and it's all there. In this group outside Dorchester, Frink commemorated the men of Dorset who, in the 15th and 16th centuries, died for their religious beliefs. This is Mary, as you know, in her 50s, a woman who has experienced a full serious life, um, the whole of life. And it's the most moving piece of sculpture. And to watch children go up and... Uh, touch the sculpture. I mean, I think most of Elizabeth's sculptures need to be touched, don't they? They, they cry out to be, have to be handled. And I had no doubt that if we could persuade her to do something in Liverpool, we'd have a great piece of work and a great piece of art. Elizabeth Frink said that the Liverpool Christ was her most important commission. As it turned out, it was also the last big sculpture in a body of work extending over 40 years. I first met Liz, as everybody in the world has always called her, uh, back in 1949, when I was 23, and Liz herself was a very young, just finished being a schoolgirl of around about 18 and a half, barely 19. She was a very handsome, not beautiful, but very handsome young girl with considerable presence, although extremely shy of me as the, as the older person. She produced a portfolio of, uh, of drawings which absolutely riveted me. They were extremely powerful, quite authoritative, not at all schoolgirls' work, let alone art students' work. They were definitive, and they covered the theme of rather muscular men astride horses, not in the usual sense of men and virility equaling horses and all the rest of it as a sort of parallel. They were connected with the idea, the theme, of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they were very powerful, rather disturbing, and totally definitive. She had arrived already. Liz Frink appeared on, uh, on my horizon, when I, I suppose, back in the early 50s. I can very clearly remember her first exhibition in the uh, St. George's Gallery in Cork Street. And uh, I particularly remember 
collection of cats. I think they were they were either dead or hanging, but they were tremendously exciting uh, creatures. You know, I'd seen nothing quite like them. They had a vitality, and um, in spite of the fact of being dead cats, um, they were very full of energy, and um, and I liked them very much. But the most extraordinary thing about that uh, period, to me, was how few English sculptors there were. There were very few. And uh, so someone like Liz um, was immediately noticeable. There was no great background of hundreds and hundreds of sculptors, as there was in painting, many, many artists. There was suddenly room to breathe for a young artist. And Liz made a tremendous and immediate impact. She was also extremely glamorous and um, uh, had a wonderful personality, of course, and um, made a tremendous mark on everyone. I felt that she was the first sculptor who was accepted broadly, widely, as a sculptor as opposed to a woman sculptor. I may be wrong in thinking that, but I think of her as the icon for um, women sculptors. I first met her when I was a very little girl. Um, I grew up with the most fantastic frank drawing in the sitting room of our house. And I actually remember that drawing before meeting her. I think it was called Falling Man. It was a head of a man in a, um, what looked like a space helmet, tumbling through a mixture of blood and air. It's called the Bird Man. And it's just been bought by the LCC to go into one of their new schools. And it's by Elizabeth Frink. A young girl still in her 20s who in her comparatively short working life has already made quite a name for herself both in Europe and in America. Uh, Alice Frink is of Dutch, uh, Scotch, Irish and Canadian parentage. And her father's a brigadier and she was born and brought up in the country in Suffolk. Whereas quite a young girl she was taught and encouraged to go out on game shooting expeditions while on holiday from her convent school. This may have had something to do with the, this curious, uh, strange fascination she has for uh, dead animals and birds and for the merging of birds into men, which, which showed in her work as long ago as her Chelsea art school days. It's the historian's and biographer's good fortune that television took note of Elizabeth Frink from very early in her career. I think everybody has a particular fear, a personal fear of their own. Many fear death. In my work, there is a constant reminder of death a bird man falling, a bird of prey and its victim. It is as important as far as I'm concerned as living. This is not a morbid interest. I just recognize it. And this gives life an urgency and acts as a driving force for my sculpture. The forms I make are inspired by respect for a life that seems to be always threatened by death. During the 60s, uh, uh, sculpture changed radically. In fact, uh, so did painting. Uh, there was a, a sweeping away of the um, of figuration in general. And of course, um, this had a, a traumatic effect on many artists. Liz, on the other hand, rose to the occasion tremendously. In fact, her background of using animals, the animal itself, a bird, can in itself have an abstract structure. And of course she seized on this and the great birds of the middle and late 60s are as typical of that. I know they, they have but a, a fairly tenuous resemblance to a, a bird or ostrich or whatever. They nevertheless have the uh, a great prehistoric bird in them. She is very much a creature of um, feeling for life itself in all its aspects. In 1963, Frink moved her home and studio to France. I can actually remember as a child visiting her in the south of France and after a three-day drive or whatever it was and turning up at this incredible chateau, winding up a road and there was this great place and it was what had been obviously a very grand farmhouse was now a complex of studios and there was Liz living in the south of France working, making the most superb sculpture out in the middle of nowhere, we were surrounded by mountains, the whole place smelled of time because that was what was growing everywhere. There were goats walking across the lawn. And I thought, yes, this is, this is it, this is life. This is, this is what it's about.
After six years in France, Elizabeth Frink returned to England and settled in the deep rolling countryside of Dorset. She spent the last 17 years of her life there in the home she made with her third husband, Alex Charkey. Elizabeth Frink's home and studio in Dorset gave her everything she needed as a sculptor. Room to work and big open spaces out of doors where she could see her sculptures in different settings. Frink's subjects, men, animals and birds, were what she knew best. She was born in the country, grew up there, and lived through the 1939-45 war as a schoolgirl. She understood violence and aggression. Her earliest images of men have a sense of mortality about them, stricken, defeated, or spinning in space. In the post-war years, an awareness of vulnerability was just as strong as courage. Judas, the great betrayer, seems constricted by evil. His gaze turned inward in frightful contemplation. His head averted at a strange angle, as if anticipating his fate by hanging. But many of Frink's male figures have an absolutely timeless serenity and confidence, stoic in their strength. Striding, running, even flying. Seated in alert contemplation, or just standing around. Unlike Henry Moore, who reduced the human head to a generalized blob to be free of specific features or expression, all of Frink's men have real features with the widest range of expression. Guarded, secretive, intent, but always alive. Ancient, murderous, thug-like fighters, the Riachi warriors, sum up the aggression that Frink saw as the tragically inescapable side of man's nature. She was inspired by ancient Greek bronze figures, bigger than life-size, rescued by archaeologists from the sea. Her own warriors are masked to hide their evil. For Frink, the horse was always a symbol of innocence, subject only to man. One of Frink's last sculptures, completed just before the Liverpool Christ, is the massive war horse, an image of uncomprehending complicity in man's wickedness. As Frink said, they carried men into battle. Although she made many sculptures of dogs, living with them all her life, Frink's last dog was a kind of memorial to a dream dog, Leonardo's dog. For Leonardo da Vinci was reputed to have spent his last years with a dog as companion. The water buffaloes, originally commissioned for a public site in Hong Kong, are the Chinese national beasts of burden from the earliest times. Frink's unexpected choice of these great creatures for her subject delighted the Chinese. The big gangster-like heads with shades, the artists called them goggle heads, have become almost a 20th century icon of brutishness, 
as well as the way we screen ourselves off from violence. At the time of the Algerian war, Frink saw a news photo image of a man in impenetrable black glasses. And I got fascinated with this character, Ruf Kier, General Ruf Kier, who was supposed to be responsible for the assassination of Ben Barker. I don't know whether you remember that case, it was some years ago. And at the same time, Perry Match ran a series of photographs of Ruf Kier, which were fantastic, with his, either with his um, goggles or sunglasses. And they were very, very striking. I, I would suppose I, I got really interested in that idea at, at the time. I then began to notice all around me many more faces, it seems to me, of, if you like, somebody hiding behind a screen. I started working on a series based on Ben Ufkir's head almost immediately. I'm not sure whether they are vulnerable, hiding behind their glasses, or whether they are threatening, because you don't know what's going on behind the glasses. I'm fascinated by threatening people in a rather unpleasant sort of way. But I'm also concerned about people being vulnerable or being hurt. These two things are rather an obsession which keeps on appearing in my work. Goggle heads, Frink made another group of four heads, monumental and deliberately stylized in their features, called the tribute heads. These commemorate the victims of violence who have died for their beliefs. Their eyes are closed. For Frink, these represent the inhumanity of man. They are the heads of victims. More recently, Frink made another pair of monumental heads with eyes open, commemorating in generalized terms those many people who have been incarcerated or tortured for their beliefs. It took guts for Frink to stick to her guns through long years when sculpture everywhere took other more abstract forms. And this steeliness of purpose was not just a sign of the usual artist's egotism. Frink had a good sense of her own abilities and strengths, but she always seemed far more intent upon something out there, beyond herself, and bigger than herself, than anything to do with vanity. Although something like her own features, rather poignantly, sometimes appear on a few sculptures. One of Frink's last themes was the idea of the green man, legendary symbol of spring and regeneration. She planned a life-size bronze, but only lived long enough to make drawings and a single head in bronze. Clio, we're about to make your heartbeat quicken. Right now, your local Renault dealer is offering 0% finance over two years on every petrol engine Clio. Visit your Southwest Renault dealer today, and you're sure to come up roses. Yeah, we've always had a TV license, ever since my old man gave us his black and white. And that did us for a few years, and when things were going better, we bought a colour set, upgraded like. Somehow we just never got around to upgrading the license, though. Wish we had. Hello. Caught us last month. Big fine. Hold on a minute. But how did they know? Now, I love this piece of sculpture. Um, of all Frank's work, which I adore, this piece, is all, it's always in my mind. Um, you know, if you say, which Frank's 
do you like the most? Which, which do you love the most? This this one springs up. It's called Seated Man. I think titles are um, a very strange part of sculpture. I think really they're a clue in. You believe in this man completely. You believe that at any second he's going to sigh, he's going to get up and walk away. This piece made me feel that it was possible to make sculptures of human beings that went beyond human beings. Just take the shoulders. You want to talk about any particular piece of this. This looks so easy. The weight that you, you know how heavy that arm is coming down on the leg. You know what that arm feels like. You know, this looks so easy. This looks like what happens when you make sculpture. Well, it isn't. And this piece has tremendous tension. And these arms are actually invented. This bears only a passing resemblance, actually, to how an arm looks, how, how flesh and blood looks. And yet you believe completely in this. And I think this very gentle, peaceful piece really holds most of the, the brilliance of Frank. You know, if you want to tell anybody why Frank is a brilliant sculptor, I think this is a, a very gentle... I mean, you believe, you can hear him breathing. People aren't made out of metal. And yet this is a human being. He's the, that, that particular mixture of fragile and strong. And he's so alive. He's zizzing, zizzing with life. Like Frink, the young artist Nicola Hicks chooses figurative subjects, human and animal, for her sculptures. She made making themes that I use respectable. She's taken the tweeness out of, for instance, working with animals. She's made figurative art respectable. I think people's um, perception of figurative sculpture had got pretty woolly by the time she started her career, and she brought back power and force, um, things that Epstein had been starting to um, explore. She took on and, and elaborated millionfold. In the same tradition as Frink, Nicola Hicks also models her sculptures from plaster. I think that um, one of the tremendous influences that Liz has had is, is in the actual material itself. The wonderful thing about working with direct plaster is that it's very like drawing and there's very little break between the thought and the action. And what you make, the immediacy of what you make, make is, is there, is, that's what's there. It's not going to shrink, it's not going to change, you don't have to cast it, it's there. I've actually seen film of Liz working in plaster and uh, it's quite interesting how different it is in each person's hands. She makes it look terribly controlled, effortless. I've always used plaster since I was a student. I discovered it at Chelsea Art School. I work very quickly and I have my ideas very quickly. Plaster gives me a chance to make something fast. If I don't like it, I can destroy it. And I do destroy quite a lot of my work. I can work at plaster with different tools. For me, it's a very immediate material. I don't like clay, it's too soft. I like stone, but carving is too slow. I'm interested in plastics and welded sculpture, but they don't suit my way of working at all. And I shan't branch out into materials like that myself. But plaster I like, because it sets so fast that I have to work very fast, and it helps me to get going. Modeling and carving directly into plaster remained the technique Frink used all through her life. I think the most exciting thing about her work is that immediacy, the fact that her fingerprints are all over it. What you're presented with in a gallery or in a park or wherever you encounter her work is what was made in the studio. That's it. Casting into bronze has very little, there's very little change between direct plaster and bronze. This piece is Dying King. This is a superb piece of sculpture. This has everything that a sculpture ought to have to make it work. The tension in this guy, where he's hit the ground, and he has, he's just hit the ground. This arm is just flung up in the air. I mean, analyze that arm. There's hardly anything there at all, and yet that arm, you know how that's felt. Just flung up in the air. It would seem like the most simple thing in the world to make that shape of a man 
calf rising up, and yet to get the tension, the feeling in your chest, of just hauling yourself up for the last time. But there's, there's hardly anything there at all. That is very, very abstract shape. He's that moment before a loss of consciousness. He's looking around for the last time. I find this piece very exciting because of the combination of the way the legs are really quite worked and leg-like. They're really quite considered. And then by the time you move up the chest and into the arm, it's just gestural. You know, and there's very little face there. It's dynamic. It's extraordinary. It could be from any age. It could be, it could be any number of hundreds of years old, or it could have been made yesterday. It's timeless, it's scaleless. And I think I'm right in saying it is actually life size. You know, it's fairly accurately a man's size. But that's all irrelevant. It's precious. I mean, people say it takes 50 years to judge whether a piece of sculpture is going to be any good or not. And we're very confused by seeing things in our own time. And this is a completely timeless piece of sculpture. It has the beauty of bones. And this is a piece about human spirit. It's about every human battle there's ever been. And he's a king because he's representing man. He is the representative. And he's dying. And he really is dying. When you see him, you know he's dying. You know, that's it. And he's not writhing around on the floor. He's, um, it's his last wave. His arm's coming up. It's a very moving piece. Frink's contemporary, Brian Neal, shares her interest in animal and human forms, but Neil has chosen a different technique to make his sculptures. One of the characteristics of Liz Frink's work is its directness, of course, and that is also the reason why she chose to work in plaster. In my own case, I turned to steel, to welding, which again was very direct, but for Liz it was that flexibility which equates very clearly with drawing. And uh, it is not surprising that drawing has been such an element, uh, uh, an important element in Liz Frink's work. All the time she'd been working, she's also drawn, she'd make lithographs, and uh, this has established a continuity in her work with whatever she's done. Some of Frink's most tender awareness of human and animal vulnerability is in her drawings. The tragic thing is that um, drawing became rather unfashionable, just like the figure became unfashionable. Artists, uh, sadly enough at times, can be so anxious to follow the herd that they, uh, they lose their own history. And uh, it's happened quite a great deal in the last few years, where the critic has led the artist by the nose. The true artist does retain an essence of uh, the very thing that be, makes you want to be an artist in the first place. When you're a child, you draw, and you find that as a language for you. And Liz has never lost that language. She's never been uh, distracted from uh, using her own essential personality as the basis of her work. Early in the 90s, Liz was diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus. She had surgery and, of course, carried on working. By the end of January this year, she'd almost completed the Liverpool Commission, a massive figure, 13 feet high. The whole figure is a process of building up and cutting down, building up and cutting down until I get to the right thing. And the final carving is what I like most, because I'm doing a lot of chiseling. It's all that textures. It comes out beautifully. Thank you. 
you change this for me, will you, love? Oh, Emma, change this for your mum. There's a good girl. Okay. Leave it. Ah, that's it. Thank you very much. What? Soft and strong and long. And Rex. Emma! <laughs> Kellogg's Golden Crisp. Sweet oaty flakes. Plump raisins with smooth slivers of almond. Altogether a rich, sumptuous taste. A little indulgence to be savoured in peace and quiet. Platform three is the... Without interruptions. Make a silence really golden with Kellogg's Golden Crisp. Your way, flame grilled, nut fried, whopper, extra onions. You got it. Chicken flamer, extra tomato, BK double, no pickle, no problem in no time. You want it your way at BK, you got it. It's longer than usual, and there are times when you're glad of the extra protection. New Always Supers one way dry weave top sheet is longer for extra protection. I recently flew to Japan to see my brother. Even sitting in a plane for hours at a time, all I felt was fresh and dry. Unlike conventional towels, always lets moisture flow through its dry weave top sheet into the towel, but virtually none back out, the whole length of the towel. So the whole surface stays fresh and dry. It's just a little longer, but it made me feel a whole lot more relaxed. New Always Super, protection that's always fresher, always drier and longer. Borton's traditional, that's more like it. I'm looking for a Panama, size 7. You have? Marvelous. Good old yellow pages. New Galaxy Dove ice cream. Galaxy chocolate makes ice cream supreme. Why pay more for exhausts when QuickFit have silencer boxes from only twelve fifty, or complete systems from only nineteen ninety with a two-year unlimited mileage guarantee? Can you afford to go anywhere else? It's your very last chance for the big twenty-one at Texas. Twenty-one percent off everything if you spend just twenty-one pounds or more. Must end nine p.m. Tuesday. Don't miss it. Twenty-one percent off everything at Texas till nine p.m. Tuesday only. By February, Frink's huge figure of Christ had been sent to the foundry for casting in bronze. But she needed to work again on the head for a few modifications. I'm uh, working on the head now, which has come back from the farm, as I managed to cut it off the torso, so that I could finish the work, which I couldn't do, because working off a very high scaffolding, the proportions changed. It's quite extraordinary. When I got it back here, how narrow across. The jaw was perfectly okay from down below. So that's a quite a big readjustment. So the whole head will be built up now quite quickly. And I'll just carve into it and get it as I want it. Instrumental in the invitation to take on the commission for Liverpool Anglican Cathedral was the dean, the very reverend Derek Walters. The brief we gave her was, come unto me all that travel and are heavy laden, uh, which are words uh, in, from St. Matthew's Gospel in the Book of Common Prayer and the Communion Service. But how she responded to that was her decision and not ours. So the risen Christ uh, was what she brought to it, because she wanted to talk about a risen and ascended Lord. I started off with preparatory drawings, which I showed the Dean and the committee, and they liked those very much which I was very excited about it because it, I had designed a somewhat unusual Christ. The sketches uh, were interesting. The first one, she, she, she showed it to us and laughed about it because she thought she went really over the top um, with this, this particular one. And I must admit, I think she did go over the top because I don't think that's a particularly welcoming figure. And that was never a, a serious contender. 
she then uh, showed us these, these two, uh, which were her figures two and three. And uh, this one, where she is almost this sort of red Indian treatment uh, of this little flap over the genitals. She, she said that she was determined that she wasn't going to have Christ in a nighty, uh, which was her phrase. But we liked the face of that, and everybody was unanimous that um, we should go along this path of letting Liz Frink take this further. And of course, from that then, she produced a maquette. I agree with the dean about this. I didn't want to do a, a sort of robed, rather a fate figure that one sometimes associates with, with, with old Christ. Mm. I wanted something more savage and more messiah-like, more god-like somehow. I think she is struggling with the idea of a Christ that is eternal, as a Christ for all time, and a Christ who is liberated, really, from being a first-century Palestinian Jew, and this cosmic figure. Now, she's never used those words to me, but, but I, I have a suspicion that's part of her thinking. Certainly, she had moved herself into thinking that she wanted a, a risen and ascended Christ. And she's trying to talk about, in her sculpture, about a Jesus figure, about a Christ figure, um, that is liberated, in one sense, from um, the historical past and, and reaches out in, into the future. There isn't Christ, of course, an interesting subject, because I believe in the spirit. I believe everybody's spirit goes on after death. Somewhere around us there are people's spirits from everywhere are voices and spirits who've lived. Because you can't tell me millions of people creating, being and living don't leave something behind in the atmosphere. And I believe very much in that. By now, Liz knew that surgery hadn't entirely removed the cancer. She had started further treatment. The fact that I have cancer and I'm undergoing chemotherapy, this commission always was important to me, but it's become more and more important because it's given me great strength to finish it in a way that my old war horse did after my operation a couple of years ago. But it's been an enormous inspiration to get going and get off my backside and just get going and um, work and enjoy things. And the enjoyment has been enormous. And now it's ongoing because I've got all the, all the um, lovely bronze for the 40. But my thing is that, you know, um, at all costs, life must be kept alive. And for as long as it's possible. And that's what I believe in. I'm in life now, first. Because it gives me terrific um, impetus to go on, you know, and some more of my family and all that, you know. Gosh, grandson and him. Nice. That's it. The casting of the Liverpool Christ was done at a famous old foundry under the railway arches in Peckham, South London. The same foundry had been casting Frink sculptures for 25 years. Large figures modelled by Frink in direct plaster are cut up, decapitated and limbs amputated to be cast by a process as old as sculpture, the lost wax process. The lost wax process is so ancient and really it hasn't changed. Except we have new materials like um, vinyl mold which pulls off instead of little piece molds in plaster. And the vinyl mold pulls off and is encased. I mean, I can't go into it, it's so complicated. It is complicated. 
from the vinyl mold formed from the original plaster, a wax impression is made. The wax is now a copy of the original, identical in size and surface texture. The wax impression is encased in plaster. The plaster is then fired, and that is the point at which the wax is lost. As the wax melts away, a cavity is formed. That cavity becomes the mold into which the molten metal is poured. The Liverpool Christ is cast from half a ton of bronze ingots. Frink was a very brave gambler in her work and in her life. It took nerve to be a sculptor as a woman on the sheer scale that Frink always envisaged in terms of the costs of materials, workshop, tools and equipment, transport and the often stupendous outlay for bronze casting. She could never just rely on commissions. She'd never been someone who has been stymied by the physical problems of sculpture because um, she had always had the strength and the energy to carry things through and increasingly she's taken on huge physical problems and you know big jobs and she's carried it out with um, great energy and style and i think that's one of the things i've been most impressed by how she carries off the change between small and monumental I mean, it was a problem that dogged more but it it just doesn't arrive in frink sculpture uh, and it is to do with having the perfect scale you look at a little piece and the essence of her hands are there and that is carried on somehow it is as if her fingers expand to make the huge pieces when you look at those monumental heads you don't think hmm, there's a huge head you think there is a fantastic piece of sculpture uh, it's not the first thought that crosses your mind the fact that it's larger than life size it has a presence the same as the presence of a man it just happens to be bigger now she has decided to go for something which is superhuman and whether it's a superhuman horse or a superhuman man it is an aspect of her work which shows her her strength and her determination maybe she decided that this is a summing up of her work um but to me she's all she has no need to do that she's already said so much and so clearly what she is about just two weeks before the official unveiling on Easter Sunday, Elizabeth Frink visited the foundry to put the final touches to her work. With Charlie Deering, she made a couple of adjustments and agreed the surface finish, the pattern and color. In spite of everything, she made her own mark on every technical stage in making the big Christ for Liverpool. Oh, listen, I need some more bronze built out here, I'll right there. You. I want to see this is far too big. Do you see this whole area? Yeah. And I want to cut this down. Right. And that won't do that, would it? I need a disc for that. Yeah, you do. Yeah, do it with a grinding wheel. Yeah. Well, would you want to build up that to make the nostril the same size as that? Do you see what happened? Yeah. I've left a hole there. Okay. Do you want I'll to do that now? Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Now, well, no, if I, I want to take this, I want to take this down. Yeah, I'm touching these off. You know, that. Yeah. So what tool should I use on this? Well, I want a disc, really. Oh, a disc, OK. Yeah. I've got that disc here. Fast moving and decisive in her life as in her work, Frink had the necessary artist's ruthlessness. She was like a friendly and generous warrior queen. Her three husbands were, of course, friends and lovers, but they had also to be active supporters as well as consorts. It's much better. Yeah. Yeah, now I just want to soften the other side.
out, Charlie. On the Tuesday before Easter, the moment of truth. Frink's Liverpool Christ would now be seen, not in a studio or a gallery, but high up on the wall of the Anglican Cathedral. When him looking his best, don't we? More important than the views of any art critic was the Dean's response. When I saw this great, primitive, uh, vibrant figure, then I think it actually changes my theological understanding of Christ. I'm very conscious of Jesus in his Palestinian setting. Um, Jesus is a first century Jew challenging Judaism and asking people questions. So I think that when you look at this figure, um, you're looking at a figure which, because of its primitive, timeless nature, you're talking about a Christ that doesn't belong only to uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, but I think belongs to the whole of the religious aspirations of, of humanity. And in that sense, it's almost like every man, it's every Christ. Frink's world is not morbid, and it's never sentimental. She had a tough sense of outrage, of injustice. She once said, my concern is not that mankind is any worse than it was. It is just that it is as bad as it was. It's very humbling. Um, I suppose my, my skills are of a, if I have skills, are about being a popularizer and you encounter somebody like Elizabeth Frank, who on one hand is very simple and a very direct person, and yet you're also dealing with somebody who has profound insights into the nature of the world, which you see in her sculpture of, of, of animals, insights into the nature of humanity, and her horror at the inhumanity that man is capable of. And also in the presence of somebody who is full of hope about the human condition. Now, to have those gifts intellectually is one thing, but to be able to actually translate them into sculpture, um, that is a humbling experience, isn't it? The Cathedral Church of Liverpool is dedicated to the Lord Christ in a special honour of the power of his resurrection. Therefore, on this Easter day, we dedicate this sculpture of the risen Christ to be an icon of the living God for all people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.